Hello, and welcome to Third Thursday at Hoover's. I'm so glad you could join us again this evening. I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. We'll begin our program in a few minutes, but first I have a lot of news to share with you about upcoming events that you're gonna to want to participate in. Just about an hour ago, I made a live announcement on Simon Con the Simon Conway Show, which is a syndicated talk radio program statewide here in Iowa, that we have just begun accepting table sponsorships for our October 7th celebration banquet. We're happy to announce our featured guest for the banquet will be President George W. Bush, and we expect tables to sell out quickly. If you're interested in attending this special event, please visit our website, hooverpresidentialfoundation.org, and scroll down the homepage to find the banquet links. We're sure, we are sure You'll, find, you'll want to join us this fall. Also on our website, you can learn about a major fundraising campaign for the renovation of the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum exhibit space. It's been about 30 years since the last renovation, and we're excited about bringing new technology and other updates into the museum. We have a special benefit for Iowa taxpayers who contribute to the Timeless Values campaign where you can earn a 25% Iowa State tax credit for your gift of any size, no matter how much or how small the gift is on there. And it's a great benefit and uh, it, would, it will really be beneficial. Tonight, I'm pleased to welcome back Annette Dunlap the third Thursday at Hoover's. Annette presented research on Lou Henry Hoover back in March of last year. And her latest work, a biography of Lou Henry Hoover called A Woman of Adventure, the Life and Times of First Lady Lou Henry Hoover will be released by the University of Nebraska Press on June 1st. Now, Annette Dunlap has been a North Carolina-based freelance writer for 30 years. She has written for a variety of publications and has been a contributor to inspirational magazines and business publications. Annette has appeared on C-SPAN, First Lady Series, and was a panelist at the Harding Symposium's Modern First Ladies program in 2015. She and her husband of 41 years live in North Carolina and they have four children and six grandchildren. I invite you to enter questions for Annette at any time during the program through the Q&A feature you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions someone else has entered if you would also like to hear those answered. As we might not have time to answer all the questions provided, top vote getters will be asked first. Thank you for joining us tonight, Annette, and we're looking forward to learning more about Lou Henry Hoover and her years at the White House. Thank you, Jerry. It's great to be back. It's good to see you again, and thank all of you who have signed in this evening. So I'm really excited to be with you, particularly on the eve of the release of my biography of Lou Henry Hoover. Jerry mentioned um, University of Nebraska Press, it's Potomac Book Imprints is the publisher, and it is coming out in on June 1st. And I will have a link available at the end of the presentation for you to order the book from the press. Um, so what I'd like to do this evening, as we've already discussed, is spend our time together focusing on Lou's years in the White House. I've been asked by several people, well, why did I get interested in Lou Henry Hoover? And I have to give the credit to a good friend of mine who is the archivist at the National First Ladies Library, Michelle Gullion, for speaking to me when I first met her, which has been over 10 years ago now. And she said to me, you really need to do a book about Lou. And this was after I had just finished my book on Francis Folsom Cleveland. Of course, my question to her is, well, why should I do anything about Lou Henry Hoover? And so what Michelle said to me is, well, Lou is, in Michelle's opinion, Lou was very much an underrepresented first lady. And I would have to say, after my years of research, learning about Lou, reading her correspondence, I would certainly agree with Michelle's assessment. Lou is very much an underrepresented first lady in terms of her many accomplishments, not only in the White House, which is what we are going to focus on this evening, but also throughout her life. Um, and I, one of the things that I have come to recognize through my research is that I strongly believe that if Eleanor Roosevelt had not had a 12 plus year tenure in the White House and then had a career following her years in the White House, 
I believe that Lou would be getting more of her due by historians than she has gotten to date. So I am hoping by bringing her story to light that we will begin to see some changes in how people and how historians particularly are perceiving Lou. So what we're gonna be talking about, and it looks like my picture is in the way. So let me um, get myself out of here. The areas that I'm gonna focus on this evening so I can hopefully leave some time for questions is um, Jessie DePriest comes to tea and I'm not gonna give anything away. We'll wait and see who she is and, and what, um, why that part is part of important with the story with Lou. Then we'll talk about the President's Mountain School, Lou's efforts for restoration and preservation in the White House, her support of local artists and local artisans, her using radio as a means of communication with the entire nation, and then her work in the White House through private philanthropy. So let's start with Jesse DePriest comes to tea. In November of 1928, the Residents of Southside Chicago elected black man Oscar DePriest to Congress. He had actually been appointed by the Republican Party, and believe it or not, Republicans dominated Chicago politics back in that era. So Oscar had been re re appointed by the Chicago uh, Central Committee, Republican Central Committee, to take the place of Martin B. Madden, who had died in office in not, earlier in 1928. And then Oscar was elected in his own right uh, in that election. Needless to say, Southerners were very angry about his election. Many refused to sit on committees with him. Many did not want then speaker Nicholas Longworth to swear him in and legitimize his election. And the attitude towards having an African American in Congress also devolved to the wife of that representative. It had been the custom for many, many years for first ladies to host a tea for the wives of the members of Congress. And so when Lou realized that there was going to be a huge brouhaha about having a black woman come to tea at the White House, she decided that perhaps there was another way to go about this and still give Mrs. DePriest the respect she was entitled to as the wife of a member of Congress. So instead of having a large scale event, which is what former first ladies had done, where it was one event, all of the wives of the members of Congress came at one time and then it was over, Lou decided to divide the teas into a series of events and she issued the invitations alphabetically. Well, what ended up happening by doing it in that way was that when people were scanning the list of last names that began with D, they did not see Jesse DePriest's name. So of course they would think, oh, well, Mrs. Hoover is not going to recognize Mrs. DePriest. She can be ostracized socially in Washington because she hasn't been recognized by the first lady. But what Lou had decided to do was after all of the formal announced teas were over, she was going to have one more tea. And at that tea, Mrs. DePriest was going to be invited along with sympathetic wives of members of Congress, sympathetic wives of members of the cabinet, as well as Lou's sister, Jean Henry Large. So on June 5th, Lou had a, a handwritten invitation privately delivered to Mrs. DePriest's home, inviting her to tea the following week. Well, needless to say, once it came to pass that the public learned that Mrs. Hoover had hosted a black woman at, into a social event in the White House, all hell broke loose. She was excoriated and condemned by legislatures in the states of Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Florida. There were letters that were written by Republicans in the South who said they regretted that they had voted for Herbert Hoover. There were all kinds of questions about why this had been accomplished. Lou, however, stood her ground. She also clipped articles from Northern newspapers that were highly supportive of her, including an article that was written by William Lloyd Garrison, who Lou wrote in a note on that clipping that she had heard him speak many years previously. 
But what this ended up doing was setting a tone for Lou's independence in the White House. Part of, and that, in my opinion, is part of the reason why we don't know as much about what Lou achieved in the White House, because from the start, she made a decision that she was going to chart her own path and follow her own conscience and do those things that she thought was right. Where we really begin to see that that independence rubbed up against Social Washington was in the fact that her social secretary, Mary Randolph, lasted about one year. Now, Mary Randolph was a carryover from Grace Coolidge, and Grace Coolidge had depended on Mary's social knowledge, social savvy, and her ends with Washington uh, socialites to help mold and build Grace's reputation. And if you are a reader of First Lady history, you're probably more than aware of the fact that um, Grace Coolidge does have a very strong and positive reputation in the White House. Lou, on the other hand, felt that it was more important for her to do the things that she thought was right. And so Mary Randolph lasted about one year. Lou never hired another social secret, formal social secretary. She used women who had been longtime retainers, as well as women whom she was mentoring into, you know, who had graduated from college, who were looking for ends in Washington. But it changed the tone of her relationship with the press and with social Washington. And so this was a, a very interesting, groundbreaking move, groundbreaking step, and demonstrated her independence and willingness to flout what had long been expected of first ladies. One of the things that was traditional that Lou and Herbert Hoover agreed was needed was to establish a presidential retreat where they could get away from the White House. And this had been a practice of presidents going way back into the 19th century. Originally, Lou looked for some, pro even though the Hoovers actually had a home in Washington on S Street, uh, Lou looked for some property in Chevy Chase, Maryland, which was a little more bucolic and hopefully a little cooler. Uh, more away from the political side of things in Washington, but she wasn't able to find a suitable property. So the Hoovers drew a 100 mile radius around Washington and they began to look in the Shenandoah Valley. Through various contacts, they located some acreage that is now part of the Shenandoah National Park and the couple built Camp Rapidan. Camp Rapidan was their retreat center. It was a place where Bert could go fishing. There was a, the Rapidan River uh, that ran through it. They built a large meeting hall for meetings. They built individual cabins. And all of this was paid for, not by the public, but out of the Hoover's private funds. And we will see how that establishment of Camp Rapidan, where it was actually was very helpful to the local economy in just a couple of slides from now. But a very interesting ha thing happened the first year that the Hoovers were at Camp Rapidam. They were celebrating Bert's birthday, which is in August. And their, uh, the White House physician, Dr. Boone, had found a young boy uh, several months earlier who had brought a, and he told the boy, if you'll come on the president's birthday and bring a raccoon, I will give you $5. Well, the boy came and he had the raccoon for the president. He was given his $5, and then he, he, was he was introduced to Charles Lindbergh. Well, the young man did not know who Charles Lindbergh was, and this, of course, astounded everyone because Charles Lindbergh by 1929 was famous for his um, flights on the spirit of St. Louis. And they learned that there was no school in the area. And so Lou and Burt, but more Lou, began to talk with local officials about establishing a school near Camp Rapidan in what was called Dark Hollow, Virginia. The school was established. It was called the President's Mountain School. It was built with the President's funds. And Lou was personally responsible for hiring the woman to teach the one in the one room schoolhouse. So Lou, before she had attended Stanford, had graduated from St. what at that time was San Jose Normal School. She had a teaching certificate. So she understood and she knew education. 
And she was looking for a teacher who would understand how to work with rural students, particularly rural students who had not had any formal education and certainly hadn't sat in a classroom. So she hired Christine Vest, who had graduated from Berea College in Kentucky, which uh, if you know anything about the history of that particular college, um, they have an ethos of their students not only working to help pay their tuition to attend the school, but also to have educations that they can give back to the more impoverished areas of Appalachia. So Christine Vest was an excellent fit. Lou personally paid Ms. Vest's salary of $1,500 a year, which was quite an excellent salary for teachers at that time. She arranged for Ms. Vest to have a horse so that she could travel into town because you could not access the school easily by road. And the other thing that Lou did was that she was responsible for hiring the architect and also the contractor who built the facility. And one of the responsibilities that these people had was to train the local men in how to do carpentry and masonry and other work so that then they would have a skill that potentially could help them become employed. So it wasn't simply a matter of building a school, but it was also getting the entire community involved and then providing economic opportunities for them by teaching them new skills and new trades. Local craftspeople were hired to furnish the school. They were also hired to furnish Camp Rapidan, and I will share some of that information in a couple of slides. President's Mountain School stayed until Shenandoah uh, National Park Service purchased all of uh, the land that included where Camp Rapidan and the President's Mountain School was. And one of the things that um, Christine Vest said was that when all of the families were moved out of Dark Hollow after the National Park Service took over that land, she felt that their educations enabled them to adjust well to living in town and to finding new employment. So even though it was a fairly short-lived project, it made a tremendous impact on the futures of all of the families that live in the community. When Lou came into the White House, she inherited a project that had begun as the result of a president, excuse me, a congressional resolution that had been passed in 1925. So we are probably fairly accustomed today, and particularly if you've ever had the opportunity to tour the public rooms in the White House, you can see that the rooms are generally very well maintained, that the wallpaper is in good condition, that most of the furnishings are in good condition, but there was just constant back and forth and uh, tension between Congress and the White House in terms of what was really necessary in order to keep the White House in good condition. You're talking about a building that even in the private quarters and in the Oval Office saw enormous amounts of traffic. And then you had the public rooms that were open for tours to the general public. And so finally, if Congress began to understand that they're gonna to have to do more than have these ongoing arguments with whoever the current occupants of the White House were, and so they passed a resolution in 1925 that allowed the White House to accept gifts of furnishings, particularly furnishings that had some connection to previous occupants of the executive mansion. There was also a committee on restoration and renovation established to keep the public rooms historically correct. And Grace Coolidge was involved with that committee and then Lou inherited that committee and worked with them. But Lou also was very much fascinated with the furnishings in the White House. And when I talk about her fascination, I'm not talking about what might be visible in this photograph, um, such as the chandelier and the paintings, but she also wanted to document individual tables, individual urns, individual vases, every single item that was in the White House, she knew had a history and had a connection to previous eras. And so she hired a longtime family friend and retainer, Dare Stark, to begin to do all the research and the documentation of every furnishing that was in the White House. And this is one page 
of that document from that is uh, available at the Hoover Library, which I had the good fortune to um, look through and take uh, pictures of. So this is a photograph that I had taken. And so Lou had these photographs taken at her expense. She paid Dare to do the work. She had the book put together. And her hope was after she left the White House that the book would be able to be published. Uh, she did approach several publishers, but unfortunately, because of the reputation the Hoovers had at, as they once they departed the White House because of the economic conditions of the country, no publisher at the time was really interested in taking a book that had a Hoover name on it. Um, possibly, as Bert was able to um, resurrect his own reputation and uh, once again gain public acceptance, Perhaps if Lou had lived longer than she had, she might have ultimately been able to see this document in print. But um, so you've got, I believe there are two copies of this document. I believe one's in the White House and one is, is at the Hoover Library. But part of her work in documenting the furnishings was also looking to get quality reproductions made of specific furnishings. And one of those reproductions was the Monroe desk, which you can see her sitting at here. Um, the, the original Monroe desk is owned, was at the time owned by uh, descendants of James and Elizabeth Monroe. And um, Lou contracted with the family to uh, acquire the desk to give it to a, car, a furniture maker by the name of Morris Dove who was a Russian immigrant who had an ex ex excellent reputation. He worked in the Washington, D.C. area. Lou paid the insurance to have this desk transported. She paid for the use of the desk so that Morris Dove could reproduce it. She did pay for the reproduction. All of this is coming out of her own funds. Um, so this, she had this desk reproduced. She had uh, a couple of other of the Monroe furnishings reproduced. And she also had another copy made of uh, a portrait that had been done of um, Elizabeth Monroe. So again, when uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is um, I've been a member of the White House Historical Association, and they spend a lot of time talking about what Jack, who Jacqueline Kennedy, who actually started that association, did in her tour of the White House and her restoration of the White House. And I will be honest and say that every time I hear that after learning what I've learned about Lou, I keep thinking that um, if I that I need to really see if I can prevail upon them to rethink how they present that, because Mrs. Kennedy is certainly not the first first lady to show a very intense interest in the historicity of the White House and of its furnishings. Lou long predates that and deserves way more accolades and attention for the work that she did in preserving the furnishings of the White House, trying to acquire new furnishings for the White House that had a historical relevance. She was very, very particular if she ordered any furnishings, even seats that she used for concerts. She wanted to make sure that they were designed period appropriate for the room. So she was very, very attentive to the importance of um, recognizing the, the historic value of the White House and its meaning to the general public and to generations to come. So I mentioned earlier that Lou was very much engaged in personal philanthropy and that she also was supportive of local artisans and that her support of local artisans particularly was beneficial in the communities that surrounded Camp Rapidan and the President's Mountain School. So you may be able to um, read this letter, but um, E.A. Clore was an artisan who made furniture who was in the Rapidan area and his workshop burned down. And so a letter was written to Lou explaining the, about Mr. Clore's shop burning down and asking if she would be willing to help donate to Clore to enable him to rebuild his enterprise. This is a letter that Lou dictated to her secretary, but it's written uh, as if it was in her own hand. And she mentioned that she had a lot of demands on her 
uh, time and a lot of demands for money from her, but she did contribute $200 in share of proposed capital for the rebuilding of the um, Mr. Clore's workshop. The part that's very interesting, if you are able to see it on your screen, if you look at the bottom couple of lines of the last paragraph, she says that she's glad to take 200 shares of the proposed capital for the rebuilding, not to be paid before five years and without interest. And this was something that was very interesting about Lou. She was very generous with her money in a private capacity, but she had created this network of contacts throughout the country who she could go to when she would get letters from people saying that they were in financial need. And I should say that it was based on the research that I did not only on Lou, but on the book that I did on Francis Cleveland, it looks to me like it was very, very common for first ladies to get letters from citizens who were hoping that they might be able to get some financial help or perhaps help with a government job. So it was not at all unusual for Lou to be getting these personal letters. And she had her secretaries who could screen for her and then send to her attention those letters that they thought merited a little more investigation. And what Lou would do is take the letters of people that she thought merited some further homework, and she would ask this network of people that she had throughout the country to check on certain individuals and make an assessment as to whether or not they would benefit from any kind of personal help. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this core letter is that the cores knew who this donor was. But there were many times when Lou also used that network in order to provide a donation, but they didn't know that she was the person who had donated it. She was very strict about maintaining her anonymity. So she paid for college tuitions for a lot of young women, including uh, black women. She helped people get started in small businesses. She helped elderly people. In fact, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that when she passed away and her family started to go through her desk drawer, they found uncashed checks of people who she had loaned money to or given money to, and they had if they knew that she was the donor, they had repaid her, she had never cashed the checks. So this is a very, very private side of her that was important to her to keep private. And I think one of the things that makes it important to understand this about her is that you know from the kind of reputation that the Hoovers have that there was this attitude of being insensitive to the pain the country was going through or what was going on with the common man. But a lot of what the Hoovers did, and Lou especially, was done very quietly, anonymously, and behind the scenes with a lot of compassion, but also a desire not to draw attention to herself. So if we kind of come back to the core um, story, not only on the philanthropic side, but also her support of businesses, then um, if you can read this, this is in her handwriting. And she, what she had done is she had sent EA Core $100, as she calls it, on account for purchasing materials for what she thinks she's going to be ordering in order to uh, furnish Camp Rapidown. And so what you've got is the invoice from Clore. And so they made for her, for Camp Rapidan, four pine beds to order, three felt mattresses, one perlis mattress, three sets of perfection springs, another set of springs, and four pillows. So the total came to $172.50. You can see the credit of the $100 that she had sent previously. So her balance was $72.50, which you can see that there is a note there, um, how much was paid and on the date it was paid. And the MH would have been Mildred Hall, who was um, Lou's secretary. I want to also say that I've, I've chosen this particular person as an example, um, simply because I have the documents to be able to show you. But there were other uh, businesses that Lou worked with. Um, Biltmore Industries, which was established by the Biltmores who built Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, also established a workshop to teach weaving and um, carpentry skills to 
local citizens to give them a trade. And they developed fabric. They had created what became known as the um, Grace Coolidge Red. If you know anything about Grace, uh, red was her favorite color and she liked to wear red. But there was also the Hoover Gray. They wove and dyed the fabric for birch suits. So that was a company that Lou was doing business with. And then when there was the White House fire in um, December of 1929, I think, that's, I think I've got my year right there, um, the following year, Lou ordered some toy fire engines to give to the children who had been of the families that had been there the year uh, previously. So Lou, again, a lot of what Lou did was very quiet, very behind the scenes, but it was done with an effort to support people who, whom she felt had um, opportunities and simply needed a little bit of a leg up or a little bit of assistance. One of the other things that Lou did was she took advantage of radio technology. Radio was a very, very new medium at the time. And so if you know your history, you may know that it started to uh, become commercialized and available to the public in the early 1920s. Burt was the Secretary of Commerce uh, under the Harding administration and then later the Coolidge administration at that time. And so Bert actually oversaw the development of uh, radio stations, the establishment of bandwidth, the establishment of licensing. And he, so he was in on that administrative side of radio being developed as a tool and being able to be regulated in a way that it could be maximum benefit for the entire country. Then the other side of it was that the Hoover's older son, Herbert Jr., became involved with radio. Uh, he was a, an avid ham radio operator. And he also you learned and used radio waves to help with air, airplane navigation. And that was uh, a lot of his life's work for many, many years. Lou was the first, so that made Lou the first first lady to use radio to address an entire nation. And this particular, particular photo was taken in the White House. And so she is the first White House resident to speak on radio from the White House. So if you think about the number of times that we've seen photographs of the president uh, sitting in the Oval Office or uh, standing in the White House press room, and probably none of us give it any kind of thought whatsoever, think about the fact that this is a newspaper reporter here taking this photograph of the first lady broadcasting from the White House, and it is a whole new novel concept for the entire nation. The two Girl Scouts that flank Lou were from Maryland, and the subject of Lou's message was an encouragement to the entire country to try to encourage one another, support one another, find local employment for one another. It was a way to help boost morale during the tough times of depression. It was a thank you to many, many women's groups that had pitched in to teach canning skills, home economic skills, sewing skills, things that could help stretch dollars, feed families uh, more healthily, and really cope with some of the economic hardships that they were experiencing as a result of the depression. So again, we get this perception of a woman who didn't appreciate it and who didn't understand it, but she put herself out there to take these messages of hope and encouragement to the public and try to boost morale and encourage people to look for ways to change their mindset, change their attitudes, change their thoughts. Unfortunately, as we know, you know positive rhetoric did not seem sufficient for as bad as the economy was, but it was a noble effort on her part. So you see, I've got the word famous in quotes here. And where I actually get this from is Lou's handwritten notes uh, on this photograph. This is a cotton dress that um, was woven with a cornflower pattern. It's made from a pattern that her mother had. Lou wore it to a reception in, in the White House. 
And the social writers were just aghast that she had not worn a satin gown or a brocade down, gown, excuse me. But Lou's purpose in wearing this gown was hopefully to support the cotton farmers. So if you were logged in to the, um, the webinar while the announcements were still going on, you may have heard something mentioned about the low cotton prices in 1930. Well, most farming prices were depressed. Lou was looking for a way to support local agriculture. And so she purposely had this dress made so that she could show support for cotton farmers, but also, again, another encouragement to think about buying and using American-grown fibers. So one of the things that I think is important, to, and hopefully maybe you're beginning to gain from what I'm sharing with you this evening, is part of why Lou has what I'm going to call, quote unquote, bad press, is she was not somebody who really was out for the grand gesture. She had um, some, and she hated publicity. She absolutely hated the press. So there are letters, um, members of the press complaining about the fact that she did not engage with women journalists, that she did not have them to the White House. She <clears throat> did not cultivate relationships with them. And to a certain extent, that uh, is a statement of her independence and her attitude about the press. It's also, un unfortunately, um, a little, and to be honest, a little bit of naivete about how Washington works, but that's also part of the reason why we don't know so many of these things about what she did and what her attitude towards things were. She just wasn't willing to share it. There's a very interesting letter that she writes to Alan, where she discourages him from agreeing to any interviews with members of the press, and then she mentions how much she hates talking to the press, and then she says to him, now, if you absolutely have to talk to them, it, basically to summarize her uh, advice, it, it came down to smile and nod, smile and nod. It was um, pretty much a case of just kind of get through it and uh, don't say anything that's going to end up being interpreted as a negative for our family. So again, this was another example of her quiet support for her um, causes and her efforts to try to boost activities and actions for um, relief in the country during the time of the Depression. This is a photograph of her involved with um, food distribution at the Central Union Mission in Washington. She also was in a, um, well, my computer will help. Okay, Oop, sorry, thought I had another slide there, but I guess I don't. She had also attended a clothing sale that had uh, the Junior League in Washington had put on the clothing that was actually made by local women. They were going to get the proceeds from the sale of that clothing. And um, it was for, uh, the clothing was designed for people who were going to be working. And it was also made by the wives of the of men who were looking for work. And so she attended to show her support for that. In January of, I want to say it was 1932, she um, helped work with the pianist Jan Paderewski. He uh, held a tour that was nationwide, and he uh, agreed that all of the proceeds from the ticket sales of that tour would be given to help the unemployed. Um, Lou organized the event for Washington along with many of the other wives of, or co members of Congress, members of the cabinet, and then Paderewski traveled across the country and performed. And then when he ended, it was in California, she spoke with Alan and asked her son to make sure that he uh, spent some time with Paderewski and also helped to provide some housing for him at um, the Hoover's home on San Juan Hill at Stanford University. So I'm gonna stop now. I see we already have a few questions and just kind of wrap it up with, um, this is the cover for the book that will be coming out at the beginning of June. You can order the book through University of Nebraska Press. That is the um, 
URL. And um, I've, it will also be coming out in audiobook, but I do not know what the release date for that is. And so I'm going to just say, if you have any questions that you don't get answered this evening, feel free to contact me. Or if you need the URL for the book, you can get it at my website. Well, and that great uh, presentation, always, always very, very informative on that. So um, we've got uh, a few questions right now. If anybody else has any questions, be sure and put, uh, go to the Q&A uh, um, uh, tab down below and uh, type them in and we'll try and answer as many as we can. We got a little bit of time. So we've got four questions right now. And I'm, so I'm going to go ahead and start off. Uh, the first one is uh, from Melanie and she goes, what are some of the changes to the office of first lady that Mrs. Hoover made, which Mrs. Roosevelt benefited from? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Um, I would say that being more involved with um, philanthropic work and being more independent uh, in terms of setting her own agenda were two things that Lou Henry Hoover did that Eleanor Roosevelt was able to kind of um, pick up and run with and, and, and take on. Um, the other thing is that, you know, Lou did all the traditional things in terms of having artists to the White House, having to oversee the uh, running of the White House. But, you know, one of the things that's interesting is there are a lot of stories um, about the number of people that the Roosevelts had living at the White House. Um, non-family members who were just a constant stream. Um, either they took up permanent residence or they were there for extended periods of time. And we always hear that as a, something of a little bit of a positive. Well, it's really interesting. Um, the Hoovers had the exact same thing going on, but the uh, stories that came out in 1933 and 1934, particularly uh, um, books from Erwin Ike Hoover, no relation to the other Hoovers who had been the usher. And there's a, a backstory to his book, um, you know, suggests that the Hoovers were very, very insensitive to the demands on the staff. And yet, you know, Lou was doing this. And then when the Roosevelts came in, and by the way, I should say, and the Hoovers were also paying for a lot of this out of their own pockets. Um, they were not budgeting this from money that was given to the presidents to for their personal food budgets. Um, and then when the Roosevelt's come in, you know, they're doing very much the same thing. So a lot of Lou's independence and setting her own tone and pace for how things were, those are things that Eleanor was able to pick up and capitalize on. Okay, great. Well, um, Ed writes, uh, did Lou and Eleanor Roosevelt have any kind of relationship <laughs> Some of the things that you've said about Lou make it seem maybe she would have had been someone that uh, Eleanor maybe would have admired. <laughs> well, if there are any Roosevelt aficionados on this call this evening, I'm really sorry for what I'm about to say. <laughs> Eleanor, excuse me, Lou tried to have a nice relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor Roosevelt, at least from the um, writing of the reporting uh, Mildred Hall wrote of the meeting between Lou and Eleanor. Um, Eleanor wasn't really having much of it. So Lou thought, um, of course, Lou had been in Washington for since uh, Bert had taken over as food administrator in 1917. So Lou had lots of contacts in Washington with Bert being in the first the Hoover and then the Coolidge administrations. Lou and uh, Grace Coolidge were actually very, very close friends. They had nicknames for each other. Um, so Lou kind of understood what was expected of the first lady. And it was just normal for Grace to explain things to her. Well, Lou wanted to extend that same courtesy to Eleanor Roosevelt. She invited Eleanor Roosevelt to the White House so that she could show her the family residence, explain how things worked. She, um, offered to send a car to pick Eleanor up. And Eleanor said, no, she didn't want a car, she would walk. So she walked to the White House with no security. She came in, she met with Lou. She was, according to the report of that meeting, very cold and unresponsive, um, just kind of looked things over. 
uh, cut the meeting short, did not want to stay for tea, didn't want to stay for any kind of meal. And so they were getting ready to leave. And because things had just been very uncomfortable and unfriendly, um, Lou realized that she hadn't even had the kitchen facilities shown to Mrs. Roosevelt. So Lou excused herself and just asked her secretary to continue with that part of the tour. Now, where this kind of gets interesting in a, in a sideways sort of way is that um, when they, uh, Julia Gordon Lowe set up the Girl Scouts in order to build support for that organization, so kind of to put a time frame in people's heads, the Girl Scouts were founded in 1912. And Lou had a very extensive career with the Girl Scouts. And that's something that you can read about in the book um, or I'll talk about when I have the opportunity to be at the Hoover Library next month. Um, but um, Daisy Gordon Lowe established the uh, First Lady as the honorary president of the Girl Scouts. So Lou, who had actually been president and chairman of the board of the Girl Scouts was now the honorary president. And of course, when we exited the White House and Eleanor came in, Eleanor becomes the honorary president of the White House. Well, Lou resumes the actual, you know, active decision-making day-to-day presidency of the White House from 1933 to 1935. And she has to encounter Mrs. Roosevelt at events. But what transpired there was Lou always insisted on great respect to Mrs. Roosevelt as the honorary president. Mrs. Roosevelt was just friendly enough but the two of them never shared a stage during those two years when Lou was the president of the organization and Mrs. Roosevelt was the honorary president. So I guess the best way to summarize their so-called relationship was there was no love lost. Um, but of course, the way in which I interpret it, um, I think that was more on Eleanor's side than not. And I guess I would just throw in, you know, one other piece of, of commentary here you know, for those of you that are students, not only trying to learn about Lou, but have read about Bert, I mean, I think it's, it's those of us who have read this, we understand that Bert became a very excellent, you know, whipping boy for the Roosevelts and the Roosevelt administration. You know, so much could be blamed on what Hoover had done or what Hoover had not done. You know, let's not go with the fact that much of what was passed in Roosevelt's 100 days had been legislation that Bert had desperately been trying to get passed through Congress before that. So you just have a lot of political things going on that impacted that relationship. Okay, well, thanks, Bert. That, that was very interesting. But um, here's, here's, a, here's an easy question um, okay. from Deb. What color was Lou's favorite dress that you showed? That particular dress was white with blue corn flowers. Um, I've got some other dresses of hers that I was, um, your museum curator of Lou's clothing was very kind to allow me to um, photograph. I don't know for sure, Lou wore a range of colors, but one of the things that was very interesting about uh, her clothing, it was all very stylish. And she preferred more neutral colors um, and non-flashy colors. But a lot of her clothing, the ones that were styled more for formal events, uh, included uh, were, were, were woven through with metallic thread. And metallic thread was uh, a fashionable uh, style at the time. But it was also, because you're talking about for real gold, for real silver, um, this was expensive clothing. This, this, this was not very simple off the rack. This, this was um, very, very high quality, high end clothing, uh, very, very beautifully and stylishly made. Okay, very good, very good. Um, Melanie uh, uh, writes, uh, she goes, uh, and, and I'm not aware of any of this, and maybe you can uh, help enlighten us uh, on this, Annette. She goes, were there, were there stories of the Hoovers being uh, terrible to the White House staff during their years at the White House? Yes. Um, I kind of alluded to that in the um, Ike Hoover book, the Irwin Hoover book. So, let, and I had mentioned in the presentation that there was a backstory. So let me go ahead and get a little bit of that backstory so that I can explain um, where some of those stories came from. 
Um, so as I said, Ike Hoover was a White House usher. He had actually been in the White House from the time of Benjamin Harrison until his retirement at the same time that, that Bert and Lou left the White House. And um, he, Ike Hoover passed away in 19, the book came out in 1934, and Ike Hoover passed away shortly before that. There's some very, very interesting correspondence between Grace Coolidge and Lou Hoover about the book. Lou was just absolutely livid about the very negative things that were written about her and Bert in the book, and she expressed her anger to Grace. And um, Lou said, I really cannot believe that Usher Hoover actually wrote these things because he told me himself that he didn't think it was his responsibility to ever share anything publicly of what he observed in the White House. Grace's response to Lou's letter was, I agree with you. Um, I have certainly gotten the same impression from Usher Hoover. And the two women agreed that they believed that the book was ghostwritten because uh, Usher Hoover needed money and it was going to, so it was sensationalized in order to be able to sell well so that I Hoover, and then they, of course his widow, would be able to benefit from the sale of the book. So there were negative things written about the Hoovers in that book. Mary Randolph, the social secretary that I mentioned, um, when she wrote her book in 1933, also kind of jumped on this. The Hoovers were terrible to work with and treated the staff very poorly. And so one of the things that's been really wonderful about the Hooverhead blogs that the library has been publishing is they are pulling um, what I would like to call is counter accounts um, that negate what was written in, in 1933 and 1934, really starting to talk about the tremendous generosity and the uh, sensitivity to the staff and the caring of the staff. And here's one thing that I would say that I think speaks to the truth of the staff caring. Two black uh, stewards, who had worked in the White House, came and attended Lou's funeral when she passed in um, 1947. And so the Hoovers had been out of the White House for 14 years, not quite 14 years at that point. Lou died in January. And you know, if you cared enough about a first lady to make a trip from on, on a on a low salary to make a trip from Washington to New York City, which is where the funeral was, um, to pay your respects. I think that speaks a whole lot more loudly about the quality of kindness of the Hoovers than what was written about them after their immediate departure from the White House. Very good, very good. Um, but one of the things uh, uh, Tom writes, can you talk about Lou's wide ranging collecting interests, those, those that she shared with Bert and those that were her, her own? How much time do we have, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got about six minutes left. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to cut it short. <laughs> um, so I'll just kind of scratch the surface because she was um, quite a collector. Probably some people, they say she hoarded or she was a pack rat. Um, she's probably best noted for her collection of Chinese porcelains. Um, she specialized in a one, one or two particular era, which I'm sorry to say I don't know those off the top of my head. I know that there are replicas of them in the um, gift shop at the library, and it is the white porcelain with the, the, blue, the blue work on it. Um, very beautiful, very elegant um, porcelains, and, and Lou became quite knowledgeable about it. Um, both Lou and Bert... <laughs> They had a thing for saving newspaper clippings and political cartoons. And um, one of the couple's joint friends, um, and I will have to admit being a little bit nervous being on the webinar, the name is um, escaping me right now. But um, if I say cheaper by the dozen, maybe somebody can remind me of who, um, who that was. But anyway, she was uh, an, a woman engineer who was friends with both Lou and Bert. She'd come to the White House to visit Bert, and she wrote about Bert showing her what he called his chamber of horrors, which was 
a collection of all of the political cartoons that were about him. And then Lou also had a tremendous collection of political cartoons. So she, um, those are just two examples, one of which they shared together and then one which was um, unique to her. Okay, well, great. Well, here is the final question uh, we have, Annette, and it's from Ed. And he goes, will you do this or a similar presentation for the White House Historical Association happy hour that they do periodically. Oh, I would love it and be delighted. So that would be a very, very high honor. So thank you. Yes, not that it wouldn't be a high honor to do it for the Hoovers, but um, at the Hoover, because let me just say, and I do want to say this now, I want to thank you, Jerry. I want to thank your board. Um, you all are very generous with me for funding my research. Um, this book is, goes out as much to you guys. And um, Tom, you get some kudos, but Craig, you're the absolute best ever. And y'all have a, a gem in all three of your men who work in the library, Craig, Spencer, and Matt. So thank you guys so much. Well, and uh, for those listeners too, um, uh, Annette will be back uh, in West Branch. Uh, I, in fact, I'm not so sure it might not be the first live program that we'll have back in Figgy Auditorium, and that'll be the last Sunday in June. So uh, we'll be sending information out on that and uh, uh, be able to talk about our book. I'm sure we'll have book copies there uh, at, uh, of uh, Annette's to sell, and uh, should be a great, great day. And I, I promise it'll be sunny in 75 in Iowa that day, Annette. So. Well, by the way, my little, um, so you all know in North Carolina, we hit 96 where I am. <laughs> and it, it's still 92, according to my little computer here. And thank you, um, person who sent this, Lillian Gilbreth. Okay, great. Lillian great. Gilbreth, cheaper by the, the, the mother and cheaper by the dozen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, listeners. Well, great. Well, that's all we have uh, uh, for questions for now. And I'd like to, again, thank our speaker, uh, author Annette Dunlap, for her presentation tonight. And also all of the public libraries who helped make tonight's program a success. Remember, the, the Presidential Library is now open seven days a week from nine to five, and I'd invite you to visit a new special temporary exhibit, which will open on May 28th called Deliverance, America and the Famine in Soviet Russia, 1921 to 1923. It'll be featuring accounts of numerous humanitarian efforts by Herbert Hoover and the American Relief Association, or administration rather, as they work to feed 11 million people a day 100 years ago. It's almost unfathomable, especially, um, and one thing about history is it always seems to repeat itself as far as a lot of what is happening in Ukraine right now. And don't forget to join us on Thursday, June 16th for another interesting and topical third Thursday program. Registration will open soon, so watch your email or our website for details. The Hoover Presidential Foundation is ready to assist you with your membership needs or charitable gifts in support of the Hoover campus and museum renovation. And you can learn more about that and even show your support at timelessvaluescampaign.org. On behalf of all of us at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we thank you for joining us and look forward to your next visit to the Hoover campus.